All right, I think we're in business now. As I said last week, we're a lot better at taking care of pools than we are at running Zoom meetings, but um, we appreciate everybody taking some time out this evening to join us. And welcome to our 20, 000, 20, 2022 customer orientation meeting. Um, and we will we'll get started here. So this year we are celebrating 25 years in business. We started back in 1997 and uh, we've grown to become one of the, the largest and most reputable pool companies here in Atlanta. Our mission remains to create and maintain fun and safe aquatic environments where communities can thrive. We hold ourselves to the highest standards of integrity and quality because our customers deserve the best. Our management team consists of myself, uh, Boyan Siakovich, who's our operations manager. He was recently promoted this, uh, well, within the last six months, six, eight months ago. Uh, Megan, who is our new staffing manager, uh, as of about a month ago, although she's been with the company for, this is her third summer. Uh, and Beth Glover, our bookkeeper, who's been with us for a while. She handles all of our regular invoicing. We have in the operations department, we have two area managers, uh, Yvonne, who was in the same, he was in that position last year. And then Peter, who was a maintenance supervisor, who was promoted this year uh, to area manager. And then we have 10 maintenance supervisors. Each maintenance supervisor covers a territory and you will have one of them at your pool. So you'll have either Igor, Lazar, Merle, Amelia, Kevin, Eric, Danielle, Malachi, Micah, or Cole. And if you're not sure who you have, um, you can contact uh, Amilla, who is our um, administrative assistant for the ops team, and she'll let you know exactly who your, uh, who your uh, maintenance supervisor is. Continuing with our service team is Fidel and Juan. These are the guys that come out and do repairs on your pool as needed. Uh, Amilla, as I mentioned, she's the lady in red. Uh, she is our, um, our administrative uh, assistant for the ops department. And then we have Mary Jane Sayre, who's in charge of recruiting and training. She works in Megan's department. Latrice Rivers, who also works in Megan's department. And Barbara Ryan, who is also working in Megan's department uh, seasonally. And for those of you who've been uh, customers for a while, you may remember Barbara's name because she used to be our bookkeeper for 10 years. She retired a couple of years ago. Uh, well, she couldn't, couldn't stay away. So uh, she's coming back in the office to help some this summer, but not in a bookkeeper role, uh, more administrative. Our pool season office hours are uh, April to, to May, April 1 to May 6, Monday through Friday. Starting May 7th, we go to seven days a week all the way through September 18th, daily 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. So if you call during those hours, a live person will be here answering the phone and able to assist you. We do have after hours emergency service, uh, seven days a week year round. If emergencies happen, this slide covers that. So whether it happens you know, off season or in season or during normal hours or office hours or after hours, uh, there's always a way you know, to handle that. So of course, if there's personal injury, call 911 immediately. Uh, that's obviously the most important thing. Then call our office after that. If we are staffing lifeguards at your pool, then they would complete uh, the incident report form, which then would be kept on file and a copy forwarded to you, if you upon your request. Uh, if there's an emergency with the pool or the pump room, like let's say the water level's off or something's leaking, uh, call our office and we, if it's during normal office hours, we can dispatch somebody. If it's not during normal office hours, there is a 24 hour, um, it's actually not a pager system anymore. Uh, it will directly connect you to the manager on call for, uh, for that day. Um, when there's an emergency involving a rescue, it's important to keep in mind that we can't reopen the pool until everything is, is safe to reopen. So uh, the chemicals have to be safe. If there was a contamination, that has to be cleaned up. The lifeguards, if they were there, have to be uh, emotionally, mentally, and physically prepared to guard again, which can be very uh, difficult after a, a, uh, completing a rescue. Uh, the safety equipment has to be present in good working order, and then the incident report form has to be completed. All those things have to happen before we can reopen the pool for your liability as well as ours. So what is happening at your pool right now? Well, we are in the process of opening it. We start this opening process about four to six weeks prior to the scheduled open date uh, that's in your contract. And so we're doing things like pulling your pool cover, inspecting your filtration system, uh, replacing any items that are needed that uh, for, for county code or for compliance. Um, anything that's under $125, we go ahead and replace that item. If it is over that amount, then we do uh, get permission first to, to do that. Uh, we do balance your pool, pool chemistry, vacuum the pool. We'll be bringing the pool furniture out if we haven't already, cleaning it and setting it up around the deck. 
and uh, scheduling your pool inspection if it's required at your pool. Most of the counties that we work with do require pool inspections. We will take care of scheduling that for you. Uh, as far as the permit paperwork, we'll, we'll talk about that on the next slide. Um, and then just we're also dealing with the challenges of pollen right now at this time of year. So if, you, if you've been down to your pool and it, it looks blue and clear and nice, but there's this weird film across the top that looks disgusting, that is pollen. Um, that's not, not a whole lot we can do about that. It just doesn't, uh, it doesn't filter out very well until people get in the pool and then it pushes to the side and eventually makes its way to the skimmers and gets filtered out. But it does take some time for that to happen. So what do we need you to do for the pool to open? Well, um, this is starting with the permit. Hopefully, if you receive the permit paperwork, you either went ahead and filed it yourself or forwarded it to us and asked for assistance. Either way is fine. Uh, some of the counties will work with us directly. Other counties will only send it to you or the property manager, and then you have to, you have to make sure that it gets uh, filed and turned in or forwarding to us. There's no, there's no cost that we charge um, to fill out the paperwork and submit it on your behalf, other than whatever the inspection fees are. Uh, please let us know if you have any spring maintenance projects happening in and around your pool. So this includes things like pressure washing your pool deck, painting or remodeling. Uh, keep in mind that pressure washing the deck is something that does end up blowing some debris into the pool. And so we don't wanna schedule that for right before an inspection or right before the grand opening, uh, or otherwise we'll have a mess and, and people will not be happy. Uh, please, if you have not already, make sure your phone is turned on and that 911 service um, is working correctly. Uh, that should be done at least one month prior to opening. You can test that by calling 911 from the pool phone um, and verifying that they are receiving the call and showing the, of your, the name of your HO, HOA and pool with the correct address. So it's important that it says pool so that the uh, EMS, if they have to be dispatched, they know exactly where to show up. Uh, sometimes it just says um, Huntcliffe HOA, but it doesn't. Say, they don't know whether to go to the tennis courts or the playground, or I mean, there there could be various different areas in the community uh, that the community owns. So it needs to say pool on the caller ID. Make sure that uh, winter dewinterizing of bathrooms and water fountains has happened. Uh, that is something that you can uh, hire us to do as an additional charge. Although some customers will just do that through a plumbing company or an in-house maintenance person. Make sure your pool gates are functioning properly and the fence is in good repair. That is something that we check as well for you, but it always uh, helps if you're also, you know, put your eyes on it. If you have not done so already, designate at least one or two representatives that'll be our primary contacts for the season. And we have a customer profile sheet that we ask everybody to fill out and send that in um, so that we can update our system when we have your current uh, contacts for this season. So what do we provide? Well, we provide all your standard pool chemicals. So that's chlorine, salt if you're a salt pool, acid, sodium bicarb, soda ash, calcium carbonate, stabilizer, and tile cleaner. Specialty chemicals if needed or extra, but it's not needed that often. Usually I'd say 10% of the time they might be needed. Uh, restroom supplies if restroom service is included in your contract. This includes disinfectant, paper towels, toilet paper, trash can liners, and hand soap. And then if you need refills on test kits or first aid kits, we do provide that free uh, throughout the season. However, a, a new kit has to be provided at the beginning of the season. And you can either provide that or we can provide the new kit for you. Uh, if there's not a new kit there, we will go ahead and do that. Uh, reason being that these items expire. And we've actually seen in recent years that some inspectors are checking the expiration, even on the first aid kits. And uh, if there's any item in there that's expired, they won't, you know, they, they won't pass. So uh, going into that a little bit further, the equipment that you're responsible for making sure is on site includes, and all of these things I should preface with saying, um, yes, you are responsible for providing it. If they're not on site, we do stock these items because we know that they're required and we can provide them for an additional cost um, as needed. But proper signage, which includes your no lifeguard on duty sign, your 911 sign by the, the pool phone and the pool rules, which in some cases are county specific, most, most counties have moved to the, uh, the state required sign now, which is called the, the uh, pool risk sign, but uh, their, DeKalb County still requires one that, that they prefer that's a little specific to them. Your ring buoy with rope, uh, your shepherd's hook with pole, your deep end rope with buoys to separate the shallow from the deep. That only applies if you have deep water, which means water is deeper than five feet. A chemical test kit and a first aid kit, as I said before, uh, we do stock those as well, and we typically will, will replace them 
uh, as needed. Usually the first aid kit gets replaced every year, the chemical test kit maybe every other year or so uh, as needed. If your pool is staffed with lifeguards, then the following items are also needed. Uh, an AED, which is not required, but highly recommended. Uh, rescue tubes, which are in good condition so that your, your um, guards can um, use, uh, <clears throat> perform their rescues correctly. Backboard, which is the item that's top right there, that's for removing uh, spinal victims and passive victims from the water. Uh, an umbrella for the lifeguard and bag valve mass, which that's the piece of equipment that's on the bottom right hand of the side, that helps the lifeguard give more effective rescue breaths. Uh, and then next would be blowers for debris removal. So if you'd like the guards to blow uh, the deck, we do recommend, uh, we would need for you to re um, provide that blower. We recommend um, electric battery powered blowers are the best because then you're not dragging an electrical cord and you're not dealing with gasoline. Uh, hoses that are long enough to reach the entire deck and bathrooms. Uh, vacuum head, vacuum hose, telescopic pole, vinyl and steel brushes and leaf net, brooms and dust pans. Those are all your typical uh, cleaning implements. So how does, or what, what could get your pool shut down? Well, if your phone doesn't work, that will get your pool closed. Cell phones don't qualify. It's got to be a landline phone for the purposes of that caller ID identification. Uh, the, if you're missing your ring buoy on the deck, or if you don't have your deep end rope in place, um, your shepherd's crook is, or hook is missing or not attached. Uh, if your main drain grate is, um, is broken or cracked, if your chlorine is too high uh, or too low, if your pH is too high or too low, um, if the water is so cloudy you can't see the bottom, or the water fountain is not working, or you have gate or fence problems, or proper signage is not displayed, all of these things can shut down your, your pool. Um, we had a question, uh, will you provide lifeguard floats? We have one that's in terrible condition. Yes, so the uh, rescue tubes, which are the, the floats I think that uh, Chris, that you're asking about, those are the, the, um, the, the very buoyant rescue tubes that they, that they um, carry with them. We do stock those and we can replace those as needed. All right, signage requirements at your pool. So your maintenance supervisor will install or, or make sure that the required signage is present already and then build the HOA for any signage that's missing. Um, if you wish to purchase your signs from another vendor, that's fine, just let us know. Uh, we just need them up prior to the county inspection date. The pool risk sign we talked about, that's the new pool rule sign, it's now called pool risks, also needs to contain pool capacity and pool hours. Your no lifeguard on duty slash risk of drowning sign, that is also required. The 911 sign, and then the COVID-19 sign signage, thankfully, is finally optional. We don't have to have those signs. Um, please be careful if you're ordering any custom signs. So if you wanna get something that's customized with your neighborhood logo on it, make sure that you run those by us before you have those made. Uh, these, these signs have to be, um, the wording on them has to be specific verbiage and the letter sizing is specified in the code. So we would hate for you to spend a bunch of money on a beautiful custom sign that does not meet code and still have to have the regular plastic sign up there. Um, and then except for COVID related signage, if these signs are not posted in your pool area, you will not pass inspection. Um, we'll spend just a moment talking about COVID-19 as that's hopefully in the rear view mirror at this point for the most part. So we're recommending to clients who are asking for COVID-19 guidance for this year. Basically, we're just following CDC guidance, which can change. But right now, um, we're really not having to have it to follow any new or uh, heightened um, uh, processes that we had to do the past two seasons. The good news is that as of today, there are still no confirmed cases of COVID transmission at swimming pool facilities. That goes for both outdoor and indoor facilities. Uh, indicating that it does not seem to transmit very well uh, in those environments. So that's really positive. Um, the COVID signage and policy enforcement, so all the, all the enforcement that we've had to do, um, trying to prevent too many people from coming to the pool or spacing, all that kind of stuff we don't have to do anymore. Uh, the liability warning sign is the one that we are still recommending that you have posted. Uh, it does provide you protection through June 30th, uh, of this year, basically protecting the HOA that um, as a business that you cannot be sued as long as you have that, that uh, sign posted. So the sign I'm talking about is the third one over here, the warning sign. That's the one that um, the, uh, it was passed into law a, see, a year or two ago um, to protect businesses that are operating during COVID times. The other two, we don't have to have these anymore. 
um, feel free to remove them or ask us to remove them or you can keep them up if you if you like at your choice. So some of the lingering effects of the pandemic, uh, as we said, follow CDC COVID guidance. We're planning for a normal, a quote unquote, normal summer um, as far as operationally speaking. However, the biggest issue I think that, that we're gonna be facing this summer is the staffing shortages. Uh, for those of you who do hire us for lifeguard and attendant um, services, you can expect to see shortages that are similar to 2021 or possibly really worse. Um, what we're going to be talking about later in the presentation is how to partner with us to recruit your seasonal staff and methods that we found have been effective at getting uh, increased applicants, uh, because that seems to be a big, big challenge right now. Service personnel are also an issue. We're, we're seeing a little more difficulty recruiting service personnel, but we're not having quite the challenge there that we are with, with lifeguards. Uh, many of the larger companies uh, and competitors that we've talked to have reduced their capacity as we have as well. Uh, and some of the smaller companies have just flat out closed because they, they got exhausted and their, their profit margins uh, tanked this last year because of all the, the price increases that we incurred in 2021. So uh, what, we, what we did actually this year is uh, we reduced the number of clients that we were managing uh, in order to be able to, to provide a, a good service this coming year as best as we can. Uh, there are still issues with chemical shortages and price spikes. Um, we can we recommend to our clients to continue to avoid trichlor, which we'll talk about that in just a moment. Uh, bleach and salt equipment are definitely the way to go, but they are seeing significant price increases as a result of so many people switching to them over the past year. Pool equipment and furniture orders are seeing extended delays, particularly furniture. If you place an order now, um, don't plan on seeing it this summer. It, it won't get here until probably maybe Christmas time. Uh, maybe an early Christmas for next summer. Um, if you do need furniture for your pool, we recommend at, urgently for this year, we recommend just getting it through the big box stores. They will have some furniture uh, in stock. It just won't be commercial grade, but uh, it, it, it'll get you through the season. Uh, if you're looking at renovating your pool, we definitely recommend planning at least six months in advance. So if you are looking at doing something prior to next season, um, we recommend going ahead and starting the conversation with us now and uh, planning ideally for the fall is, is the best time. The spring, every, a lot of people wait till the spring and it, it gets very, very hectic. So jumping back to the trichlor, uh, for those of you who are not aware in what caused all this problem, uh, just a quick recap. In August of 2020, Hurricane Laura hit the Louisiana coast. Uh, what happened was a fire broke out in the biolab plant. That's a picture of that fire as the plant was burning. Um, the, the plant was a total loss. And this plant happened to be responsible for over a third of the production of this product, which is the, the sticks and tabs that you see at the top there, uh, nationwide. So it took them a while just to get permission to rebuild the, the plant. They are under construction right now. They estimate that it will be finished sometime in August or September of this year. And then they have to do uh, test runs on the product. And so they've told us to expect the first product hitting the shelves in uh, first quarter of next year. So that will not be helping us this year, but hopefully we'll be providing some relief for next year. Uh, so we continue to see a massive trichlor shortage and price spike. Uh, this particular product has tripled in price from what it cost us about a year ago or a year and a half ago. If you are in Fulton County codes, so this is, we're gonna do a, a code update here in the next couple of slides. If you're in Fulton County code, um, they are enforcing these no diving tiles. So this was kind of a mixed enforcement last year where um, if you're in Fulton County, you might be aware that they have three different offices for their health department, the North office, Central and South. Last year, they were enforcing this code or this portion of the code um, very differently depending upon which office was handling it. So uh, now all three offices are on the same page and everybody is requiring these, these be installed prior to this season. So if you don't have these symbol, uh, symbol tiles installed, let us know. We will we'll get on that for you right away. Um, the symbol, style, symbol tile uh, must be installed on the deck next to the depth markers. So that's the, the tiles that say, you know, three foot or five foot or what, whatnot uh, in the shallow end. So it does not require it on the water line, only on the deck. In Cherokee County, um, they did a little flip-flop on this um, requirement. So initially they announced last year and again in February of this year that they were gonna enforce the same no diving symbol uh, tiles that Fulton is. 
But as of a few weeks ago, they rescinded that. So just be aware that they have changed their minds. They're not going to enforce that for this year. Um, so you can rest easy if you're in Cherokee and you don't have those tiles. Uh, other things that they did change this year, they want the hours of operation for your pool and your bather load posted in four inch letters or numbers at the entrance to your pool. There are not any signs that are pre-made with that, but you can get signs that uh, have a blank space where you can fill in with a Sharpie. Just make sure that your Sharpie letters or numbers are four inches tall. Uh, we can help you with that if needed. Um, the certified pool operator requirements for Cherokee County are that they visit twice a week uh, at a minimum and be able to provide assistance when necessary, which is an improvement over what they were, were requiring in the past. It's a little, little bit more lax. They also made their slide attendant requirements a little more reasonable. So whereas they used to always require two attendants to operate a slide in Cherokee County, now you can operate uh, at, with one attendant so long as that attendant can see both the top and the bottom of the slide. If the attendant is stationed at the bottom of the slide and they cannot see the top, then we need two attendants to operate that slide. And then finally, they have clarified that they are very serious about um, inspections, mid-season inspections. If any uh, pools get shut down in Cherokee County, the $100 reinspection fee must be paid and they have to come out to reinspect to get uh, approval to reopen. If anyone reopens without that reinspection and they catch you, they will slap you with a $500 fee. Uh, so just be aware of that. New um, Department of Energy regulations um, affect our, our pool pumps, and that this actually went into effect last year, but it still is having a, a lasting effect this year. So what this is, is uh, it's a new energy efficiency requirements for swimming pool pumps that are in the one to three horsepower size, which happens to be the most popular size for commercial pools. And what they're trying to, uh, what they have done is they've told manufacturers they cannot manufacture these pumps and, by, and they're talking about whole units here. So what you see in this picture is a whole unit of both a pump, which is the wet end here, and then the motor uh, with the control panel on it over here. This is a variable speed pump, and this is what everybody has to buy now if you need an entire unit. So what we're, what we're saying now is if you have these one to three horsepower pumps on your pool, as they start to die, you wanna, you wanna uh, be budgeting for replacement and be ready to uh, to be to be either um, stepping up considerably in price to get the variable speed ones, or looking at a remodeling your pump room and doing a single speed larger horsepower pump. So the way to the way to uh, comply with this new law is that uh, you can buy either a five horsepower or larger pump, which can be single speed, um, or if you have a three phase motor, you can comply with that. Those those pumps are exempt. Or if that's not feasible and you need to change out these, these single pumps, then you have to go with a variable speed pump, which is almost not quite double the cost of a regular uh, pump. The advantage of these are is that you can run these at uh, slightly slower speeds and you can adjust the speed. And basically that'll save you a little bit of energy. Will it pay back the difference? Mm, it'll take you some time, but uh, it is a new energy requirement to be aware of. So uh, something to, to discuss. Uh, for a lot of clients, we've already been approaching uh, approaching you if you're in a situation where it's time to start considering this because you're seeing equipment failure, uh, then you're, you're, you can be looking at applying the cost of doing a repair versus doing everything up to the new code. Now, the good news is that uh, you don't have to worry if something goes down mid-season, we can still buy parts for the single speed pumps, uh, single speed motors, bearings, things like that can still be replaced um, individually, but entire units cannot be sold. And so those single, single uh, speed motors are being phased out. So if equipment repairs are needed, um, your contract does not include repaired equipment, uh, repairs, parts and labor, contamination, uh, extra visits, uh, or extra visits for vandalism or act of God, or any extra service visits that you might request um, just, just because you want an extra service visit. So for anything that's under 125, as we talked about before, we go ahead and take care of that for you because most of those items are wear and tear items that are uh, gonna be uh, needed for code compliance. If anything's over that, we always let you know and give you a price to, uh, to decide if you wanna approve it or not. Okay, so what if you have a question about an invoice? Well, uh, that's fine. Um, please let us know as soon as you have a question. You can contact Amila 
She is our ops admin, and you can reach her at the service request email. That's service.request at searsable.com. And she'll look into it for you, make sure she explains the charges. And if there's still any questions, um, you know, we'll, we'll work it out uh, for you. Um, if it's a contract payment invoice question, Beth Glover is, is the main person who sends those out. So you would reach her at accounting at searsable.com. Key cards, uh, cards and lockboxes. So per your contract with us, um, you should have provided us three sets of key cards for each uh, of your pools. And we put one set inside the lockbox and then we keep two sets at the office uh, as backup in an emergency if something were to happen to the others. So we, we install lockboxes at our customer sites. Those are for our team's usage. So that's for our maintenance team and our lifeguards to use. We ask that you please not give that lockbox code out to other contractors. We're happy to share it with you if you'd like, um, but please don't uh, share that with the landscapers or swim team or caterers or DJs or anybody else that's coming in there to, uh, to do something at the pool because when keys go missing, it really makes it hard for us to do our job. Um, if you'd like a separate lockbox put up for any of those other groups, we're happy to help with that as well. Just let us know. So now your pool is open for the season. What's next? Well, your maintenance supervisor will be coming out either two or three times a week as included in the contract. And he or she will be testing and balancing the equipment or balancing the chemicals rather, uh, checking and servicing your equipment, vacuuming the pool, blowing the deck, uh, restocking the, the restrooms and, and cleaning those, emptying trash. And then uh, we also do quality control visits by myself, our operations manager, um, operations uh, assistant and, and staffing manager as well. Any questions about the day-to-day -day operations, you can call our office or service.request at searsable.com is the best way to reach out to us. So Amila will typically receive that email and then she'll assign it to the, the appropriate staff member to respond to. Pool contaminations, AKA code Brown. So um, usually uh, on average about once a season, um, your pool will probably get closed. Uh, it could be closed for poop or vomit or, or hopefully it's one of those and not something else. But um, in those cases, uh, these instructions come from our, our lifeguard manual, but uh, so they, they may or may not apply to you directly. But uh, in the case of the lifeguard, they would clear the pool. If, you, if you're at the pool and there's no lifeguard there, we would ask you to clear the pool and just ask to get everybody out. Uh, and the next thing we would do is we uh, clean up the contaminant, whatever's in there. Um, if, if it's one of our lifeguards, they have to call that into the office so we know what's happened. And then the maintenance supervisor will discuss with either the lifeguard or whoever's on site about what the next step is. So in certain cases, if it's uh, vomit or solid poop, it's really a, a pretty simple process. As long as the chlorine is two or higher, um, a 30 minute closure is all that's needed and then the pool can reopen. Um, however, if, if it is diarrhea, we have to come out and shock the pool, get the chlorine up to 20 parts per million, and then the pool needs to be uh, closed for the full day, a full uh, 24 hours. It's actually 27 hours is the new recommendation. Okay, so, uh, oh yeah, and I forgot to mention this, is, if, you, if you forget, it's, uh, this is a friend of mine came up with this, he's another CPO instructor, but uh, two if it's poo, that's your chlorine level, or 20 if it's runny, um, a little humor there. All right, um, Virginia Graham Baker Pool and Spa Safety Act. So if you've been on your board for 12 years or more, you probably are familiar with this, uh, this law. So this law is named after Virginia Graham Baker, who is the little girl there in the picture. Uh, she died at age seven from a suction entrapment incident in a home uh, spa or hot tub. And um, the problem was that there, was no, there were no compliance standards for this to prevent that, that type of thing. And so as a result, the whole industry uh, developed these new standards and everything got a whole lot safer. Um, but there's some hoops that we have to jump through to make sure that your pool is compliant. So um, most everybody became compliant back when this was required and they had to do so by the summer of 2009. But what a lot of people forgot is that these, these covers expire every five to seven years. Uh, it doesn't mean that um, they're going to fall apart or disintegrate in front of you, uh, but it used to be pre this code that you didn't have to change your main drain or suction grates until they broke. Now we're supposed to change them out every, uh, every time they expire. And the lifespan is uh, dictated by the manufacturer, and it is set to the timeline starts when they're installed, and then um, they expire typically five to seven years after that. 
So the reason that it starts at, at date of installation is because the plastics are rated, uh, their life expectancy is rated depending upon uh, exposure to chemicals and UV rays from the sun. And so that's how they came up with these life expectancies. Uh, the problem is that there is no national database that has all this information. So uh, the way that the law is drafted, property owners, which means the board members, are responsible for tracking this and, and determining when they are due to be replaced again. Um, if you had us replace them for you, we do put that in our database and we, we track that for you. But uh, if you're a new customer or if you were to leave us, um, we wouldn't have that. You know, we wouldn't be able to track beyond that. Um, but ultimately, the responsibility does fall to the property owner. So please be aware of that. This is one of those pieces of information that we recommend to our clients uh, that is a must pass when you're passing the baton from one board to the next. Um, make sure that the information of the last time these were changed on your pool uh, is, is transferred. And that includes your main drains um, and your equalizers, which are the little fittings underneath your skimmers, and then the sumps, which is the area underneath the main drain grate. Um, those are three areas that have to be compliant. Um, just an FYI, if you need any of this optional equipment, we can help you with any of that. So pool covers, furniture, as we said, that's big delays on furniture right now. Uh, salt systems, um, lifeguard stands, pool, uh, swim team equipment, things like that. We can help you with, with all of those things. As I mentioned before, if you are planning pool renovations, plan ahead. Uh, we can help you with your pool resurfacing, retiling, coping replacement, deck resurfacing and replacement, uh, pump room redesign, kiddie pool redesign, water feature installation. Um, and uh, all of those, uh, all that is managed through our renovation department, which you can reach at renovations at searspool.com. All right, at this point, we're gonna start transitioning to the material that covers, uh, that is pertinent to our staffed members or our staffed um, customers rather. So uh, we're gonna talk about the difference between lifeguards and attendants. We're gonna talk about the staffing sh uh, shortage, the challenges, the causes, and the strategies that we are employing to, uh, to address these things. And so for our non-staffed customers, you are free to go, but you're also welcome to stay and listen. And even if you're non-staffed, please help us by spreading the, the good word about all these awesome positions that we are trying to fill this summer. So you can do that by uh, taking our recruitment flyer, which we can send you, and uh, e-blast that to your community or share it with, uh, with uh, social media channels. And if you just contact us at lifeguard at searspool.com, we'll be happy to send that information to you. All right, for our lifeguards, when we staff a lifeguard, their number one priority is patron safety. So how do they achieve that? Well, they achieve that through patron surveillance. So um, in order to, to be providing patron surveillance, you also have to have consistent rule enforcement and be paying attention. So we ask that our customers please support our guards and communicate to the community that uh, they need to follow the directions of the lifeguards. If there's ever a question that the lifeguard is giving incorrect direction, um, please uh, feel free to direct that to Megan and her staff and we'll address it. Pool rules should always be posted uh, publicly so that they are available for reference if the lifeguard needs to refer to them if, if a member ever questions them about a pool rule. Uh, violation of pool rules can result in disciplinary action, including uh, dismissal from the facility. No glass is a, is a rule that we have to worry about every year. Um, somebody always tries to sneak in glass at some, some pool. Uh, and then breaks are really necessary. It's their time to recoup and um, rehydrate and re-energize for the next kid swim. Please help us in, in treating our lifeguards with respect at all times. Um, remember that they are young, that uh, in most cases, I should, not everyone, but some of them, <laughs> most of them are young, and it's their first or second job. And sometimes they need coaching. So if you do recognize it's something that is problematic, bring it to our attention and we will address it immediately. For those of you who hire us for pool attendance, that's a little bit of a different job. And the number one priority of our pool attendance is to enforce your membership usage. So basically controlling access to the facility and making sure that no one's coming in that is not supposed to be there. Uh, so to do that, we need you to provide us a list or a way, a method rather, of identifying the residents and members who are in good standing and those who are not in good standing so that we know who to turn away and who to admit. Uh, so that can be key fobs, codes, bag tags, or a list. Any of those methods um, work. If you do provide a list, uh, we would ask that you update it, you know, at least on a weekly basis. Um, to avoid any misunderstandings at the, at the gate. 
Um, in addition to, to monitoring the, the entry to the pool, they perform some secondary duties, which include you know, opening and closing of the pool, chemical checks, uh, restroom cleaning, if included, trash removal, straightening furniture, enforcing no smoking or no glass policies, and then emergency facility closures, such as contamination or weather-related closures. They can handle that. If you have any water features, and by water features here, we're talking about diving boards and water slides or spray features, but primarily we're gonna focus here on the diving boards and water slides. This is just a, uh, a brief rundown of the extra rules that, that need to be enforced at your pool. So we don't want children in the deep end of the pool unless they can demonstrate the ability to safely swim at least one width of the pool and tread water for about 30 seconds. So if a lifeguard sees a child and they don't look like a strong swimmer, they may ask them to exit the, the, uh, the deep end or perhaps do a, a swim test if needed. Um, there's always only one person allowed on the diving board, one bounce and jump, no double bounces. Diving is only allowed in the deep end. We do recognize that a lot of you have swim teams and that's fine. And with proper instruction, certainly uh, shallow diving um, is, is doable and, and certainly encouraged in a competitive environment, but our lifeguards can't really uh, keep an eye on that during the, the open swim time. Um, we, we do ask that you make sure your play features are listed on your HOA liability insurance. Sometimes customers have insurance and they've been with the same insurance provider for years and they don't realize that somewhere in the fine print, certain things are excluded. Uh, for instance, diving boards are one of those where a lot of uh, insurance companies have written in specific exclusions in the fine print. And so if you have a diving board and you're not sure if, you're, if your insurance covers it, it would be a good time to talk to your agent about that. Um, following the recommended guidelines for the safety use or safe use of your water slide, if you have a water slide, again, very similar to diving boards, one person at a time, no trains going down the water slide, um, no children on laps, always go down the slide feet first, and no flotation devices. If a child needs a flotation device to go down the slide, then they're not ready to go down the slide. If a child needs to go down on a parent's lap, then they're not ready to go down on the slide. Um, unfortunately, we understand that's not popular, um, but those are the, the rules with water slides. All right, the Fair Housing Act and your pool. So the Fair Housing Act affects community associations in, in ways sometimes that uh, board members are not aware. And so that's why we put this slide in here. One of the main ways, really is two main ways. The first main way that we'll talk about is diaper policies. So a lot of times communities have, have uh, policies that say children under a certain age must wear swimming diapers, but actually that is in violation of the Fair Housing Act because it discriminates on the basis of age um, and familial status, which are protected classes under FHA. So what we have to do is, is those rules have to be written in a way that they are addressing a, a certain undesirable behavior, not a protected class of individuals. So you can say any incontinent guests must wear swim diapers, but we don't wanna specify a certain age uh, when it comes to net needing to wear swim diapers or you could run afoul of the FHA. The other way that FHA often comes into to play is with adult swim. And most clients we recognize have an adult swim time and they like calling it adult swim and they want the kids out of the pool and that's totally fine. And I would say 99% of the time that there's not an issue with that. However, there are a few legal issues in in enforcing a, an adult swim in the true sense of the word. And again, we have an issue with uh, age and familial status. So um, if, for instance, you have a patron that challenged enforcement of adult swim, and, and I mean legally challenged it, uh, it would not be defensible for the HOA to, to defend that. There's already cases, uh, legal precedent cases that, um, that have shown that uh, elsewhere in the United States. So what we recommend is, is um, we can enforce a traditional adult swim, but if it is challenged, just be aware that, uh, first of all, you'll want to get legal counsel for that. Um, and I should back, walk all these comments back by saying we are not attorneys. Um, I got this advice from attorneys, but we are not attorneys, and it is, does not necessarily apply to you. Uh, you should always check with your HOA attorney first before following this advice. Um, let's see. So... And then uh, we get the question often of how old should children be to swim without adult supervision? And so our recommendation is somewhere between 12 to 14 years old. Um, legal precedent has shown that to be defensible. When you start getting into um, 
uh, 15 and up at the age of 15, they can be a lifeguard. And so it's basically at that point, we know that they can, you know, they can understand the, the uh, dangers of, of water. Uh, we've got a couple of questions here. So uh, let's see, children who cannot swim in the deep end of the pool, um, life preservers or parents. I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, children who cannot swim in the deep end of the pool. Right? Hi. Uh, yes. This is Paula White from Duke at least too. I asked oh, that question. Oh, hey, Paula, yes. So um, often parents will go into the deep end of the pool and mm -hmm. their little toddler will be in either a ring or have those little arm things on or some kind of, I, that's why I put in quote, life preserver. Um, ah, I see. So what do we say to those parents? Well, um, yeah, in those cases, I think if you've got uh, supervision, direct supervision of the parents right there with the child, I think that's probably okay. Uh, okay. But we don't want a situation where the child is just wandering on, you know, by themselves uh, there in, in the deep end. I think that's that's asking for trouble. Um, also, I think there is there is something to be said for um, being a Coast Guard approved personal flotation device versus, uh, say, water wings, for instance. Water wings are inflatable. They're highly unreliable. If a child jumps in and puts their arms up, they can completely slip off the arms. Um, so those are things to, to look out for. We, you know, we talk with our guards about that, but also it's good to know, um, it's good to know uh, for, for you as, as well. So, uh, but yeah, it, it basically I think, to answer your question, I think it's fine if the parent is right there with them. Um, we, I don't want to get in the way, in the way of any swimming instruction that a parent might be you know, giving uh, their child or, um, or just family time in general. I think, you know, right there with them is probably fine. But if the parent is on their phone or reading a book, um, then, you know, the child probably needs to, to head on back to the shallow end. Okay, what if we have both swim at your own risk and lifeguard coverage? So this is gonna be a lot of pools. A lot of pools have this. And even this year, uh, we may run into this for the pools that don't plan on, on this because of the shortage. So um, we just, here we say, you know, please messaging to your members this year is gonna be very important because of the shortage to remind the residents to follow the rules, whether the lifeguard is on duty or not, and to respect the lifeguard's authority when enforcing those rules. Uh, because there, there is, it is difficult for a guard to enforce rules when the patrons are used to doing whatever they want when the guard's not there. So please help us reinforce that message. That would be great. Um, you do need to have a no lifeguard on duty sign posted at all pools, even if you have a lifeguard there, uh, because technically the lifeguard's off duty on their lifeguard break. So even during that time, um, you want to have that sign up there. Waiting pools are pretty much always considered so much your own risk. So it's it's good to have those signs next to every waiting pool to remind parents that they're responsible for watching their kids there. And then just double check that your insurance covers swim at your own risk time, uh, particularly if you're in that transition phase, if you're thinking about you know, dropping guard coverage, uh, make sure that you do, you do have that. So some guidelines for staffing your pool. Um, industry standard recommendations for guard staffing are one guard for every 25 to 30 patrons for what we call flat water. So flat water is basically like the picture that you see there, um, a, a pretty you know, straightforward geometrically shaped pool that doesn't have any visual obstructions. You can see across the, the pool completely. Um, that's flat water. Um, but sometimes those requirements, those staffing requirements uh, increase when you have to consider the shape of the pool, any play structures or visual obstructions, glare, uh, and things like that will affect your lifeguard stations and the number of lifeguards that you need. We recommend opening the pool with a lifeguard no earlier than 10 a.m. and closing no later than 9 p.m. just for staffing uh, considerations. It's difficult to staff outside those hours. On holidays, consider that your, your usage may be um, increased and plan ahead for that. And then also typically what we see at, at almost everywhere is after July 4th, swim team season is over and a lot of families go on vacation and we start to see pool attendance drop. So those are times where you can, you can usually look at reducing guard coverage uh, if needed. And then um, we're gonna talk about water watchers here in, in a few more slides, but these same concepts apply when, when using water watchers. So inclement weather, um, as long as the pool, if it's raining, as long as the bottom of the pool is visible, the patrons can still swim. But if there's thunder or lightning, everybody has to get out for 30 minutes until after the last thunder or lightning. 
And so this sometimes is difficult for little kids to understand that they also can't be swinging on a handrail or sitting on the diving board. Um, anything connected to the pool could uh, pass along a shock if the pool itself is shocked. If you have a swim team, please let us know when your practices are, your meets and banquets, um, and if you need lifeguards for any of those activities. If you do, what are the expectations for the guards during the swim meets? Uh, are they simply watching or do you need them to assist with uh, setup and teardown or any special duties that they would be doing uh, during the meet? Um, consider, are your coaches lifeguard certified? Uh, and then also we'd like to bring up that if you have a swim team, you really should have a separate insurance policy uh, a lot of a lot of HOA insurance providers exclude organized team activities or organized sports activities. So uh, here's here's an area that if you if you're not sure, check with your current uh, agent and see if you have an exclusion in your policy for organized sports activities. Uh, my understanding is that's become very common for general liability policies uh, for HOAs. And so what what you need is a separate policy, which is not very expensive but it is something that you wanna to get to have coverage for any time that you're having an organized sporting activity. So this would also cover your Alta tennis as well. Okay, so now we're gonna get into staffing shortage topic here. And uh, first we're gonna talk about what's, what's happening. Why is this happening? What's, you know, where's this coming from? So uh, just a very brief recap here. So Looking back historically, and I pulled uh, some of this data from the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics and, um, and then this article from Pew Research. So from the 1940s to the 1980s, teen summer employment basically followed um, general economic trends, meaning that anywhere from 46 to 58 percent of teens were working during the summer, uh, summer months. But we saw a, a big drop off um, in, the, in the late 80s, early 90s. And it's fallen down to about 30% or 30 to 35%-ish right now uh, as far as their involvement in the summer workforce. But one thing that these statistics are hiding, or not hiding, but it's just invisible, is it's not showing that the, how little they're actually working now. So years ago, we had like we've had the same um, 30, 35%, we've had the same, you know, these same numbers for a number of years. However, they were working more hours. The problem now is that the kids who are working, they're working fewer hours per week. And I wish I could find a statistic on that, but I have not found it yet. And so a lot of people are saying, well, the question is why? Why are they working less? Well, um, and the common response is, well, these kids are just lazy, right? They're not like my generation. And I'll be honest that I felt I was guilty of thinking the same thing. So I, I did some research on it and it turns out it's not true. Uh, basically, what's happening is that over the same period of time, you can see in this chart, uh, right here around 1990, you start to see teen uh, labor participation drop dramatically. And at the same time, you see a rise in enrollment in college. So it's almost the exact same percentage. It's about a 20 percent uh, swing either way. So and the rate of teens that are not in college, not employed, or some form of other training has remained flat. So pretty much the, the lazy bunch. Is, is about the same. Um, what's happening is the kids are doing what our culture and what our society has told them to do. Get into a, a, a university, get a four-year degree, and you're, you're gonna be you know, on the road to success. Well, we can talk about that, talk about that message another time There's, <laughs> uh, and how I feel about that. But uh, th this is the effect that, that, that is causing this. So these kids are, are feeling all this pressure to get into university and everything that they do is focused around improving their resume and increasing their chances of getting into the university of their choice so that they graduate and they get the dream job that they want and, uh, and their life is just a glowing success every, you know, from there on forward. So what does that mean? How does that affect us? Well, they're available fewer hours in the summer and they are not guarding as long as they used to. Whereas kids years ago, on average would, would start with us and they would work on average three to four years, uh, three to four summers guarding. Now it's closer to two and in many cases just one season. And then they, they move on to internships or, or um, summer school credits to, to get ahead. Uh, whereas it used to be 30, 40 years ago, summer school was for kids who needed to catch up. Now summer school is for kids who are trying to get ahead and improve their chances of getting into the college of, of their choice. 
Um, this has caused all, all of these factors plus COVID have caused a major staffing crisis around the country. Um, there's an article here that just came out a few weeks ago where Newsweek is reporting that the lifeguard shortage is so bad this year that a third of public pools may not be able to open. Uh, the city of Phoenix announced a crazy $2,500 incentive to sign up to lifeguard um, because they need to fill hundreds of positions for the 2022 season. I happen to be friends with the director of aquatics there, and I, I just traded a message with her uh, earlier this week. And, uh, and, and she told me that um, they're only planning on opening 14 out of their 29 pools this year because they just don't have the staff uh, to do it. And, um, and I asked her, how did you afford that huge incentive? She said, well, we plan to close some of the other pools. So the money that they save by closing the other pools, they've used to, to shift toward paying these guards this incredible incentive to just to sign up to guard. Uh, the city of Austin, Texas reported last week that they are short 600 lifeguards headed into this summer. Philadelphia has, uh, has reported, and all these are from news articles, uh, has reported that they only, op they only opened 70% of their pools last year. And it's looking like as of, as of a week or so ago, they only have enough guards on staff to open 25% of their pools this year. Uh, in addition, here in Atlanta, um, the city of Atlanta closed their pools late uh, July last year due to operational concerns. And some of that was surrounding uh, lack of staff and staff's ability to, uh, to manage the pools. So it's, it's a really severe issue that has not gotten enough attention, but um, just want to put it on your radar. So what's happening here in Georgia? Well, the March, 22, the March uh, 2022 unemployment um, report came out from the Georgia DOL last week or the week before, and our unemployment rate fell to 3.1%, which is an all-time low. And the labor force here in Georgia is the highest it's ever been. So it, there's not really many other people to hire. Uh, other interesting statistics show that the leisure and hospitality industries average a 20.4% increase in wages from February of two years ago to this February. That's the industry that we're in. So we're seeing wages increase dramatically uh, and having to compete with that. And then the other factor here is the sector with the most job increases year over year is accommodations and food services, which is the sector that we compete with a lot. A lot of these kids when they're thinking about their summer jobs, they're deciding between, say, working in food service or lifeguarding. There are 34,000, over 34,000 new jobs year over year in that sector. And currently, there are over 17,000 new job postings um, in that sector, people looking uh, for, to fill those jobs now. So as you can imagine, uh, rampant inflation is expected. Um, there's a link to that story there if you'd like to read it. And I can share these slides with anyone uh, later if you'd like as well. So why is it so severe? Well, um, it, particularly in lifeguards, because of COVID, we were, the last three years, our, our recruiting cycle has been interrupted. We haven't been able to get into schools. Just this year, we've started to be able to get into some schools to recruit, but not everyone's letting us in. And during that time, a lot of guard certifications expired, a lot of instructor certifications expired, and, uh, and, and folks just haven't renewed them. Uh, so the problem is there's not enough new certification classes being offered for guards or instructors. Uh, and then a lot of the folks that were in those instructor roles and, and were working as guards around the country, there were a lot of facility closures, complete closures. Um, we don't realize how lucky we were here in Georgia to actually be able to have a two, uh, 2020 and a 2021 season. Elsewhere in the country, a lot of facilities were just flat out closed or operating on very reduced schedules. And so those staff had to go somewhere, they went elsewhere and found other jobs and they're not coming back to aquatics. So it's, it's really caused a major staffing shortage in our industry. Um, further exacerbating that, the industry has relied for years on the J-1 work visa, which is a summer work and travel program where we bring students over um, to work for seasonal positions. And that has been on hold for the last three years as well due to COVID and they still have not uh, figured it out uh, in Washington how to make it work. Um, because it's become too political of a hot button issue and, and it's, it's not getting resolved. So we, we won't have the number of J-1 visas, uh, very few J-1 visas this year allowed into the United States because of the, the COVID complications. Um, you've probably heard of the Great Resignation where so many people decided to call it quits during the pandemic. Uh, well, those jobs didn't go away, just the people went away and they decided to retire or, or do something uh, less time consuming. And so now those teens are filling many of those positions that adults once had. So you're seeing more teens working in retail environments um, and, and food service than, than even before. 
Uh, and as I mentioned before, the working teens are working fewer hours on average than they were, say, five, 10 years ago. So that, that reduces their availability. Um, summer internships and travel are back on because COVID is now winding down. And what we've seen is a just overall through COVID, we've seen a major generational and cultural shift toward more flexible work. That is one of the top things that people are looking for when they're looking for new jobs is flexible work. And let's face it, you know, if you've got a lifeguard shift, you're either there or you're not there. There's not, there's not much flexibility about it. Uh, you can't work from home and lifeguard. Um, so the, the type of work that, but the type of work that can be flexible um, is, draw, is very attractive to, to um, even the teenagers. So what we're seeing is remote work is now the new norm. Teens are finding ways that they can make money online uh, and work remotely at their convenience. And uh, a big factor is that parents can now work remotely. So now parents can afford longer vacations, whereas the family might have gone on a one week vacation in a typical year. Now they're going on two or three week vacations and working remotely from their vacation uh, for the other two or three weeks with their kids there too. All right, so enough of the bad news. How can we find more guards? All right, let's, let's talk solutions. So these are the, the strategies that um, Megan and myself and others have put together that we found to be successful. L letting us put uh, now hiring signs in your communities. We've got uh, these wonderful signs that just say now hiring lifeguards, apply online at seriouspool.com. Uh, we've had good luck with people seeing those and applying. Uh, sharing on social media, we have employment flyers and we have video messages, uh, little one to two minute ads that, that you can share on social media that would help us get the word out. You can e-blast that information to your community and your swim team. Um, please refer friends. We tell our lifeguards get a $25 referral fee for every friend they refer. And every entry is also an uh, entry to win a thousand dollar scholarship that we're giving away. Uh, if you are in, in your community, if you're in contact with any local organizations that have access to potential candidates, such as youth groups or clubs um, where kids congregate and might be interested and open to thinking about a summer job, uh, if you can put Megan and her team in touch with those individuals, we'll reach out to them and share the information with them. Um, and we do also offer subsidized training. If there's anybody who is interested but just can't afford the training, uh, we have found that um, most kids, it's not an issue, and the communities that we serve are typically middle to upper class communities, but sometimes we do have candidates that would love to guard, but they just can't afford it, and we can make that happen. Um, it's very easy to apply online at searspool.com. So let's talk about the Water Watcher program. The Water Watcher program is something that's been around for a number of years now, but we, we kind of implemented it last year when the short had started, and we're going to broaden it this year, so anybody who would like to participate all you have to do is request, and we will provide free water watcher tags to, to you and your community. Um, water watcher tag is basically a lanyard and a tag that identifies the adult who's responsible for watching the water at that time. This assumes that there's not a lifeguard present, um, or it may be that there's a, a community event going on and we don't have additional staff to provide uh, for, that, for that holiday party, for instance, and you might have some water watcher volunteers to help with that. Um, we also can do water safety education events. We uh, we can do those on site at your pool, um, and we can also do them remotely um, via Zoom. We're planning a, an event for May, which is National Water Safety Month, so we'll look for an announcement on that come in the next couple of weeks. Uh, we can also hook you up with resources at redcross.org, uh, NDPA, which is the National Drowning Prevention Alliance, and poolsafely.gov. Um, but we, we put on these, these presentations um, either at your pool or virtually, and they can be targeted toward uh, your community, um, toward kids, adults, or both. So the Greater Atlanta Water Safety Alliance is how we do that. That's a nonprofit that I started a number of years ago. And um, yeah, I actually just talked about this. So we can come out and do a presentation where we do a safe swimmer pledge, which is an example down here. Uh, we have water safety tattoos, coloring books, and wristbands for kids, water watcher cards, and, and informational brochures for adults. Um, just some statistics to, to be aware of that drowning is actually the leading cause of uh, injury death in children ages one to four. Um, more drownings occur in shallow water than deep water. That surprises a lot of people. There's approximately, uh, it's, well, it's actually between about 3,600 to 4,000 people drown in the United States annually. Most of that drowning happens in the summer months and half of that drowning occurs in group settings, meaning that there's more than one person present. And in many cases, 
the individuals around them don't even realize that somebody is drowning. So we talk about how to recognize the signs of drowning um, and how quiet and, and quickly it can happen uh, in these presentations. So uh, even if your lifeguard, or even if your pool is not lifeguard staffed, um, we do ask that, uh, that you send the message out to the community reminding parents that just because they, they walk in and there's a lifeguard there, it's not time to abdicate their parental responsibility. They still are responsible for supervising their children when they enter the pool gate. All right, so our quality control systems that we have in place, we have a service ticket uh, tracking database, which follows any service ticket that you might call or email in. So when you use that service.request email, for instance, and you request uh, an extra visit or you request um, more paper towels or, or anything like that, um, the ticket gets, gets entered and that gets assigned to the appropriate staff member and follows that issue through to resolution. We do have GPS tracking on all of our service vehicles, so we know where they are, when they're there, and how long they're there. So if you ever have a question about when, are, you know, when was your guy here last, when was your, your staff here last, we can tell you that. Uh, we do make quality control visits randomly to our, to our customers' pools, and we divide those up through the management team and, and uh, stop by as needed and randomly throughout the season. Uh, we do have our lifeguard scheduling and timekeeping is done through an online software program, which is really fantastic. So lifeguards actually put in their availability and we make the schedules there and all the timekeeping is done there as well. They clock in and out using their cell phones. Their cell phone has a GPS location device on it, which then time stamps the, uh, that they are in fact at your pool uh, when they're there and when they're leaving. Uh, we do in-service training for our guards mid-season to, uh, to keep them sharp. But with all these things, we, we are not there, the management team, we cannot be at every pool all the time. So we do need your eyes and ears to keep us informed. If you do see something, say something, and uh, we promise we will get back and address it as quickly as possible. Please provide us with feedback. Um, we are always available to talk and uh, please don't wait to the end of the season to report a problem. That's, that's, there's nothing more frustrating than for us to get a call in September saying, well, this issue happened all season long and something we could have fixed relatively easily. Uh, we do send out customer surveys mid-season, so please take those and, and respond, and you'll be entered into to, uh, drawings for gift cards for that. Uh, follow us on social media. We are on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and our, our accounts there are pretty active. Please consider leaving us an online review. We love to hear from you. Google, Facebook, Yelp, and searspool.com um, all have a review. We're listed on all of those, and you can review us on any of those if you'd like. If you do have a concern, please let us know. And we're reaching the, we are reaching to the questions. Okay, we do have a question here. Um, insurance liability with a volunteer. Uh, that's a great question. So if you are deputizing uh, someone then that would be something you, you might want to um, discuss with your, with your insurance provider. Um, it's possible to have a committee of, of water watchers, and if they are deputized by the board, they can be covered under the directors and officers' uh, coverage there uh, is my understanding. But again, I'm not insurance underwriter, so that is something that you would want to ask them. Uh, but yeah, there, there are some concerns with, with that. Um, the way I look at it is, though, if you know, somebody on the deck watching is better than nobody on the deck watching. But great question. All right, I'm going to stop the screen share since we're out of slides. And uh, we'll go to the, to the Q&A portion if you guys, anybody wants to jump on and ask a question or, or type a question. All right, I'll, I'll ask you guys a question. How, how was the presentation? Was it helpful? Is there anything that we could add to make it more valuable for you or remove that was just not helpful? All right. Good job. Shelby. Curtis Frazier. Thank you, Curtis. Um, I will add that, um, you know, that the strategies that we talked about as far as uh, finding staff have been, uh, hard fought and through trial and error. So, uh, but we found that these things have worked and the, we have some pools that are fully staffed and we have some pools that have very few staff. Uh, and pretty much the secret, the secret sauce is that the pools that are fully staffed are those clients who have partnered with us and really tried to reach out to the community in their area and help refer uh, staff to us. Uh, the, the customers who have not engaged in, with us yet are the ones typically where we're, we're struggling more. So that 
that level of engagement from you um, is, is really appreciated. I, I recognize, believe me, we recognize that um, you're in volunteer positions and we appreciate everything that you're doing and you know, you pay us to do this. And yes, um, you do pay us to do this. And it is, uh, it's very frustrating for us to, to come and say, hey, we're, we're struggling. You know, uh, it, it's not something that we're, we're proud of, but I can tell you it is everywhere and the, the shortage is, is so severe. Um, it, it's going to be a rough summer, I think, all over the country, particularly for lifeguards. We are going to do our darndest to provide staff every moment that we can, and we're going to train our staff as well as we can. Uh, that is our commitment to you. Um, if you can help refer staff to us, you, that will be so appreciated and that, you know, we'll be able to provide a better service to you. Um, and that has, that's really been the number, number one way that we've, we've seen this work really well. So we have a couple of questions here. Um, it says Kristen sent questions to Kendall. Okay. Well, Kristen and Kendall, you guys are awesome. You are an example of, uh, of a customer that's really partnered well with us and really helped uh, direct guards to us. So thank you. Uh, that's been that's been very helpful. Um, AC is asking, is it possible to rotate lifeguards uh, with sister pools in the area? Yes. So some communities have strict policies that they will not hire from their community. That's okay. A lot of our pools are clustered, and so we can we can swap, we can um, reciprocate, and we can have guards from one community working in another community, and vice versa. Uh, and we do rotate guards in as much as it is possible to do so to cover shifts. Uh, in some cases. We may have a guard available in Ackworth and a shift open in Lawrenceville, and they're just not going to be willing to drive. Uh, so we, you know, th those situations do happen sometimes, and we and we can't do anything with that. But it, whenever possible, we try to uh, we try to shift guards around as needed. Although the main goal, of course, is to try to keep the core at uh, each pool. Um, let's see, Kristen's asking, uh, when will the slides be available? Oh, I can uh, I can have the slides out uh, pretty quickly. I can I can email that uh, to you tonight. Anybody that wants them, if uh, if you want to email me, Craig at searsbull.com, I can send you a copy of these slides uh, after the presentation. Hey, Craig, I have two questions. This is Anna from Parkbrook. Hey, Anna. Um, one is if we are missing anything for inspection. I'm assuming you guys will let us know. I know we've had a couple of things we've had to work through, but at this point, if we don't have anything outstanding, do we assume that we're good or is there so do? You, yes, you should be good. Um, I would, I mean, in order to speak intelligently on that, I would need to talk directly with the ops department and make sure that they've done, okay. they've completed their, their checklist and, and where we are. Um, because uh, so between Boyan and Amilla and the ops department, they have, they're typically very systematic as far as how they go through and do the openings, the checklist and schedule the, the inspections. So um, probably all of that is, is on target. I, I'm happy to check on it for you um, in your specific case, if you'd like. Okay, well, I can follow up as well, but um, I just I just wanted to confirm. And my other question is about lifeguards. I know last year we experienced just kind of, um, I, I know you guys gave us as much advance warning as possible if there was going to be a, a gap in coverage. Right. Um, from your expectations at this point, do you have any kind of days, like are weekends more difficult to staff versus weekdays or certain hours that we can kind of start planning ahead or strategizing with you guys, or is it just going to be kind of Sweet. last minute? That's a great question. I, Megan's here. I'll, you want to take that one? So um, honestly, it's going to be across the board, particularly in that area. We are really, um, we're struggling to recruit and hire in the entire Alpharetta Johns Creek, um, just that whole area there along 400 and over to Peachtree Industrial. Um, mm -hmm. The best, it, it if you can put me in touch with your swim coaches, I mean, anybody that you guys know that has access yeah. to the teenagers, because really the biggest thing that we're struggling with is getting in front of the teenagers and getting the face time with them. So if you guys have any recommendations, I, churches, synagogues, youth groups, anything that it, high school swim team coaches, yeah. like you said, I, we, we've had some mm -hmm. high school swim team coaches that have been amazing and sending out our flyers and, and, and driving in applicants. So um, but we only know, you know, I'm, I'm pretty active in the swimming community and I, I know a lot of coaches, but I certainly don't know all the coaches. So 
Um, right. and, and, and your area in particular, Anna, is is tough. It's uh, you know, it's a it's a area where the kids don't don't need the summer jobs and um, uh, are a lot of times on vacation a lot during the summer. Yeah, no, I understand that. Okay. Uh, we do not actually have a swim team. We partner with a different neighborhood for the swim team, but I can certainly mm -hmm. out, we start that next week. So I can certainly raise okay. that with our coaches there. Um, sure. Or even the, are, the high school where involved. your kids go too. Yeah. Yeah. It's part of Alpharetta that we feed into Alpharetta as well as um, mm -hmm. Chattahoochee. So both of those and okay. Johns Creek isn't too far, but um, so I can definitely get the word out to those guys and we'll certainly post it on our Facebook page as well. That'd be great. Yeah. And we're happy yeah. to send, I don't know if you guys have seen it. We've been sending in the customer uh, newsletter. There's a, there's a um, two minute video that we did where I'm talking about kind of the frequently asked questions about, you know, do I want a lifeguard? And, and, and honestly, one of the biggest ones we get is just about the scheduling and the kids assume, well, I'm going to be gone, you know, three weeks on vacation, one week for camp, and then I'm going to college early. Do I really even have time for a summer job? And, you know, it's, it's at the point where we'll, if you're available three weeks, we'll take you, you know, we'll, we'll make right. it work. You know, we'll, you know, our software thankfully is flexible enough that it allows us to, to do that. So they can fill out exactly when they're available. And then that gets cross-referenced with the shifts that we have. Um, and, you know, it, it, it's plug and play basically, but um, the more kids we get, it's, yes, it's a giant, giant puzzle piece. Uh, that yeah. We have. Okay. yeah. One of the other big questions we get is, do you have to be certified in order to apply? No, no, you do not. No, <laughs> will... you have to be certified to work, yeah, but you, you don't have to be certified to apply. We will help you get the class you need to get certified. Yeah. And that's that's really one of the key factors, as I was saying before, because you know so many certifications have expired. Um, we we had to do you know we did another instructor class because we didn't have enough instructors, and it took uh, it took a year of planning, trial and error to get enough. I mean, it took forever just to get to pull off an instructor class. So just um, finally, we got that done, and that's been that's been really helpful. But you know, the 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 number one um, training venue in Atlanta, basically, just they 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 just now announced their their classes, and they usually start back in January, but or February. But um, so they're way behind. I mean, it's just there's not enough classes, so that's kind of a, a really confining factor is um, getting them signed up for a class. So we want them to apply as soon as possible so that we can help them find a class. Even if they can't take a class through us, we network with other venues that teach the class and we'll, we'll find a class for them. But yeah, anything you can do to share um, the flyer or the video uh, with, with people in the, in the community. Um, and high, yeah, high school swim teams, I forgot to mention that, but that's, yeah, high school swim teams is, have been uh, a wonderful help in about three or four high schools. But I would love for more to be <laughs> to be engaged. I don't want to hold up your evenings, but uh, thank you so much for taking the time out to to meet with us and uh, to ask questions. And hopefully, this was valuable time for you. And uh, if there's anything we can do to help and assist, uh, let us know. But I know Megan and her team are working overtime to to address this. And um, you know, we we are I, I'm pretty well networked in the aquatics uh, world, but you know, this is this has really tested our. <laughs> Our network so we're, we're reaching out anywhere um, for a potential lead so thank you so much for for coming tonight and um and and please share those items and uh, we look forward to working with you this summer